and we're live in start preemption hello and good morning to everyone pat is uh, is it live yeah it's live it's live you can start hello and good morning to everyone pat yourselves on the back for making it to day 2 of dev space this is just the beginning and we have got a lot more in store for everybody i'm priyanshu kumar and i'll be one of your hosts for the event along with kaushal arushi anubhav shubhi and vaishnavi some of whom you have met already let's get started with the event we have in store for you guys now you might have heard of buzzwords like data sovereignty and decentralized information well even if you have never heard of them before you are at the right place to learn about them we at devspace 2022 are ecstatic to introduce you to our keynote speakers Mr. Christian Casaza, the co-founder of Athena, and Mr. Timothy Carter, the CEO of Athena, who are going to discuss the threat of centralized information infrastructure and the importance of data sovereignty in the information age and look into what's possible with decentralized information infrastructure in the new data economy. Christian Casaza has had a variety of domain experience such as finance, real estate, venture capital, e-commerce, e and currently he is a co-founder at Athena Protocol. building a set of tools for data driven environmental and social governance in the future athena seek to close the gap between the actual world and blockchain as well as between stakeholders and the processes that affect them athena is building the tools that will empower future generation while also addressing privacy security transparency fairness and accessibility problems and we have timothy carter who is a data scientist machine learning engineer and blockchain solutions engineer He is passionate about expanding diversity and accessibility in the field of information technology, and he has extensive public speaking experience to complement his technical abilities. He has worked in a variety of fast-paced, fast-changing grassroots environments, and so he is appropriate mix of amicable, agile, and accountable for a forward-focused work environment. Athena's objective is to build a new paradigm for sustainable development that uses technology. to achieve long term challenge that benefits everyone it provides communities governments business ngos and other stakeholders with technical solution that will be able to address key global concerns such as climate change and with wealth inequality please join us in welcoming christian casaza and timothy carter Perfect. Cool. So my name is Christian. I'm here to talk to you today about data sovereignty in the Web3 data economy, and we are Athena Protocol. And so today we're going to talk to you about some of the tooling that's unlocking data sovereignty. My partner Timothy will tell you a little bit about what we're working on there at Athena Protocol. So we at this point, we I think everyone understands how much of our world runs on data. From what we see scrolling on our phones, shopping online, even applying for jobs, we are encountering algorithms run on our own data that affect our real lives and determine how we view the world. Now, while this implementation of algorithms and AI holds a lot of promise for improving our lives, from increased efficiencies and nearly everything we do, to discovering hidden insights in our data that we wouldn't have otherwise had, there's also a possible dark side. We can we can just if we aren't careful, we can just as easily ingrain existing inequalities and bias into our society by if our data is not held in a safe way. Now, to ensure our, our to ensure that our data is being used in an equitable way to help our world, we need to address a fundamental problem. We don't own any of our data. Right now, it's being controlled by centralized entities such as Google, Facebook, and Uber of the world. Decentralized gatekeepers really control our information infrastructure and affect how we see the world. For the sake of convenience, we've allowed the internet to morph from open and free protocols to centralized and protected, run by these companies. These companies, because of how ingrained they are in our lives and how much we need their products, they have pretty uh, pretty free reign to extract as much data as they want from us and use it however they want without us having really any say in this. Now, this has gotten really bad over the last several years. as they've been able to extract more and more value from our lives. Now, fundamentally, the value of the 
what, how these Web2 companies work is they keep our data in centralized silos. Each, each company keeps hoards their data themselves in order to gain a competitive advantage against others. And it's a winner take all business model, in which case they, whoever moves first can accumulate the most data can use it to produce better models and better insights into their customers, which they can use to acquire more users and start up a process over and over. Web, in Web 2, these businesses are designed to hoard this data and make it difficult to have data collaboration, have, use, having to use one-off APIs to effectively communicate across businesses. Companies like Amazon and Facebook even make it especially difficult to use their APIs because they want to maintain as much of the information and reliance on their information infrastructure as they can. And while this business model is very profitable for a select few of these gatekeepers, it comes at a large cost to many. Over the pandemic, we've seen the revenue of big tech companies substantially increase, and they've really only become more, even more ingrained in our lives. However, there are several mass, massive problems of how they're doing this. For one, the value sharing between companies is extremely inequitable. As um, Web2 companies, we, they have given us services for free for, that have largely remained the same for over the last decade, even a while they have seen their profits grow and grow by extracting more and more of our data. They, Web2 companies who own the gate, who are gatekeepers, don't see an easy way for kind of sharing data equitably. As an example of Facebook, just the other day when they wanted to release a test case for using NFTs, they were thinking about having a 47% uh, cost of to mint NFTs in their platform. We also, these companies also create information silos. Because they're incentivized to keep information private for the sake of their profit, they actually eliminate our ability to understand new ways. Instead of having open, instead of having collaboration between health, for healthcare to advance disease research or open sharing of environmental data to address climate action, we instead allow a few companies to maintain their silos for the sake of increasing their profit. And, the, and this isn't just a problem for profitability. This is affecting real lives. The, these companies, because they exist in silos, their algorithms and their AI that they unleash in the world, they exist in black boxes. It's impossible for a third party to really have a true understanding of how these models work, what data they're using to drive decisions, and whether or not they're just ingra they're ingraining existing bias into our world. These, and the, these, and the, uh, and not, it's not even just theoretical how dangerous this are. We've already seen examples of how black box algorithms can cause allow bad actors to affect our world. Just in 2016, in Cambridge Analytica, a small group of data scientists harnessing untapped massive amounts of data from Facebook were able to were able to influence elections around the world, in the U.S. and in India, in the U.K. Because. The, they, the data owners had no way of ensuring that their data was being used correctly as Facebook wanted. And because of that, they were unable to stop, stop bad actors from influencing the world. Now, fundamentally, because there's, such a, there's a, a massive lack of trust in the world because of the structures we are existing in now, well, in most places in the world, less than 50% of the citizens really trust organizations to use their personal information, with in India actually being one amongst the highest at just 58%. This is causes a, this is causes a lose lose for everybody. Access to more information and more data will allow us would allow us to reach greater levels of insight into the world, and we'd be able to solve much a lot really challenging problems a lot easier. However, as long as people don't trust that their data can be used and they're not being properly compensated for it, then we're gonna, we can only exist in a world where we can't have this open data sharing economy. And so it is time for a change. Instead of having our, it's time, for, instead of having our data be owned by a few centralized gatekeepers who, uh, who decide how they use it and who and how, how they much make revenue from it, data sovereignty is a belief that individuals who should own and should own and decide how their own data is used they should be able to decide how it's monetized who gets to use it who runs in who and what type of information can be gleaned from this and data sovereignty doesn't just mean how can we how am I, I have in control of how my data is monetized it also means how you get to decide how your data affects the world you can use your data to in, in, give insight to organizations that align with your values and ones that you trust aren't going to use your data for bad purposes. Data sovereignty gives us the optionality to own our data and use it to affect change in the world in a way 
in, in a way that has, isn't being done today. Now, luck, and the only way to get there, and one of the key pieces is is unlock is using Web three specifically and using Web three tools like Ocean Protocol. Ocean Protocol provides a suite of tools that unlock the data economy at a base level. And so it, is, it was built on top of EVM compatible change and it's designed to be agnostic. What Ocean Protocol has done is it's repurposed existing refi, DeFi infrastructure in order to suddenly bring out an out of the box solution to unlock a new data economy. By, by, trusting and use, by utilizing Ocean Protocol and the various tools they provided, we can suddenly take back control of our data and own it and decide how it's used by others. Ocean Protocol has several moving parts that they use in order to ignite the data economy. On the front end, they have applications and marketplaces that people can use to interact with data and purchase it. And they go in using existing crypto wallets in order to access and hold data. And they have back end they have back end infrastructure for monetizing and creating data assets. And so that's so easy to use that anyone can decide that they how they want to upload and, and create a new NFT of their data. They have middlewares that help to manage the the management of data assets and who and have helping to decide who has access control to their data in a very fine grained sense. They, and they lastly they have a smart contracts to help facilitate this whole market moving around between payments. And who and who and deciding who who owns data when it's sent to others? Ocean Protocol has many different has a few different aspects at a at a very granular level. But I wanted to highlight just a few of them to under, really understand how how they do what they do. So number one is one of the key principles of Ocean Protocol is a is the idea of base IP. It's so Ocean Protocol. They they've taken the idea of non fungible token and NFTs and repurposed that to be, to act as base IP for as base IP. So what that means is if you own a particular data asset or really anything such as a photo or music, you can mint that as a data NFT and that shows your your exact ownership of that asset. In order to then monetize that asset and allow others access to it. You can mint fungible ERC20 tokens against your non-fungible ERC NFT. You can create net different types of data tokens with different levels of access control and access to the data. This creates a very high level of flexibility that can really be used for monetizing any type of IP and unlocks a whole new way of monetizing our data and deciding who has access to it. Ocean Protocol actually uses uh, a small different type of ERC-21 called an ERC-725. It has a few additional benefits to like updatability and flexibility for who has access control and is worth looking into. The overall benefits of this approach is, it for, is allowing it unlo un unlimited flexibility to monetize and own your IP asset. One of the coolest aspects of Ocean Protocol that really ignites this data economy is their invention of compute the data. So one of the biggest obstacles in the open sharing of data has always been the trade-off between losing security of your data and, and the, the, op, the op, up upside of monetizing it. So traditionally, once an, organiza once an organization wants to monetize their data, they must trust that the data buyer is going to have their high level of security of their data. Once it leaves your server, you're no longer in control of what happens to your data as it can be, as it can go anywhere with a copy. Ocean resolves this by bringing the compute computation to the data. So data buyers, they, they send the type of algorithms and computations they wanna run on raw data. And then it's trained on premises where the data buyer is already holding their data. And so it stays that for machine learning eyes only. Then from there, so on. Oh, sorry, I thought it froze. Cool. And then from there, um, it, the only the after after the computations are run on premises, the outputs are sent back to the data buyer. And so, by having the data never leave where it's already being held, a lot of the problems involved with sharing data and having to stay GDPR compliant are now resolved thanks to Ocean Protocol. This is a significant this is a significant boost compared to existing uh, opportunities for sharing data, 
And one of the most exciting parts of Ocean Protocol and the, the ability of how it, what it can unlock with privacy preserving computation. And one of the last highlights of Ocean Protocol I want to highlight is their Ocean Marketplace. Ocean Pro the Ocean Marketplace is a front end application that allows anyone to sell and monetize their data. As you can see the interface, you can simply click into it and decide the type of data that you want to buy. You would purchase your you would purchase the ERC access tokens using an existing crypto wallet, such as MetaMask, and then you can run you can run the computations of existing machine learning applications such as Jupyter Lab. By you now this Ocean Marketplace is a, is a front end from here, but this is actually completely forkable. Anybody can very easily start up their own Ocean Marketplace and become their own data marketplace by using Ocean Code and using Ocean on the back end. They they see a thousand thousands of marketplaces all at different verticals and in different localities building out as opposed to having one giant data market and that, so fundamentally this is a new a new paradigm shift we're entering we're entering a world where instead of data being held in faraway databases and duplicated everywhere owned by corporations that can do whatever they want with it we're entering an era where we own our data assets and we decide how it's being done this is, and now because we own and we have our data assets and we have that ability to monetize it, this unlocks entirely new business models for the world. Quality data collection and monetization can now in itself be a sustainable income for entrepreneurs that want to go out and collect valuable data, especially in remote regions that where work might be difficult. Now they now anyone can kind of go out and start collecting valuable data in, in demand from their local from their local area, maintain it and manage it. And, and gain long-term sustainable income from their data asset. We can also see a decentralization of AI. Instead of having to rely on centralized organizations that only have massive repositories of data to run quality machine learning, now any practitioners can go to Ocean Marketplace or any or anyone powered by Ocean and run computations on that raw data assets to generate new algorithms. It can then utilize Ocean Protocol's existing infrastructure to allow their algorithm to run and become a new business in and of itself using decentralized infrastructure to allow that to happen that's what we can have now in order to facilitate all this movement we're also going to see the creation of data DAOs, it's, as opposed to having each individual having to exactly decide what happens with their data and monetizing it for themselves it can allow trusted third parties to manage their data assets on their behalf and this will allow, and as more data is collected and we aggregate with our neighbors in like in, in regional areas, we can we can have to create more valuable data assets that create a flywheel of value. And these data DAOs can ensure that everyone has a voice in how their data is used, it being used in an equitable way, and it's following everyone how they want it to be utilized. Fundamentally, we're opening a world of a new open data commons that can be used to solve a number of problems in the world, from healthcare to autonomous driving, to climate change and ESG. We can now enter a world where we're all contributing to a open data commons and, sh and solving problems together, as opposed to having to go it as instead of having to go at it alone and trust only your own existing data to s solve new problems. We can all contribute to problems together and reach our solutions in a fundamentally faster and more efficient way. This, this is all thanks. To, this is really being unlocked thanks to Ocean Protocol and the ability to own our own data and have, and have data sovereignty thanks to Web3 tooling. So before we so before we go into how you know, Athena Protocol and what we're focused on working on, I want to just open this up for any kind of questions from the audience. Just double check, make sure everyone's on the same page. Yeah. So, uh, thank you for that amazing keynote, Christian and Timothy. Uh, we'll now be taking up any questions that our attendees might have. Yep. So the first one is from Vaishnavi Rathod. It is, how can individuals benefit from a Web3 enabled data economy? Individuals can benefit in a few different ways. They can decide to monetize their data directly. And so if they pull off their data from Twitter, from Facebook, from Uber, and go the effort of doing that, they can decide to then own that data themselves and monetize it for third parties. They can decide to have that data be aggregated by data DAOs, such as Data Latte, who aggregate that, who aggregate tons of different types of data together to make them more valuable. Or an individual can decide to be a machine learning practitioner and purchase open data on the Ocean Marketplace. They can run their own algorithms. They can clean the data to improve it. 
and they can use that to create more or find more valuable data assets off of others existing work. And so by having this, there's a ton of different ways and flexibility of how you, anyone can get involved in that economy between owning and collecting data or refining it. Yeah, that was a good answer. Yep. Yep. Uh, so, and the next one is from Kaushal Rati. Uh, he asked, how would a decentralized data economy uh, handle accountability? Accountability from malpractices, from bad actors, like, so how would that be possible? So one way that the decentralized data economy helps to handle accountability is unlocking blockchain superpowers of account of traceability. And so using Ocean Protocol and like something in particular Athena is working on, when algorithms are run, you can they'll come involved with the exact traceability of what data what data assets were used to train it, what were the type of algorithms that were run, when were they run, and like and what were the exact inputs that went into that. And so, as a, so, if you're using an, uh, an algorithm that's trained on the decentralized markets using decentralized infrastructure, we can actually have that traceability to trace it back to all of its inputs, as a, and we can have that on an open ledger where everyone trusts, as opposed to having to trust the centralized gatekeeper like Facebook or Google that their algorithm is doing what they said they're doing, even though in the past they've shown that it, that's not simply not true. We have now we, because of decentralized the, and the, the ledger aspect of in crypto now. We can we can trust that the algorithms do what they say they do. Also, oh, Ledger kind of keeps a track, like whoever has been working on what, and everyone can see it. Is it like that, or? Uh... Oh, I'm yeah, sorry. Can you... you, there's a, a transaction history, like in the ocean mm -hmm. uh, market, for example. There's uh, open and uh, transparent transaction history, but there's also mm -hmm. the ability for individual data providers to uh, create a governance model over their data asset that suits their needs. Um, so they can have a, a whitelist or a blacklist of, of, of uh, you know, organizations that are allowed to access their data. Um, and then um, we touched briefly on the use of the ARC-20. You can have one singular ARC-725, one piece of base IP, and then you can create very specific um, access rights. You can say, uh, permit the use of a, a handful of algorithms um, or permit um, the, the looking at um, a simple set of features um, at once. Um, and those can all be tokenized separately so that you can ensure that each consumer is only using your data in the way that you have set forward. Oh, so that kind of increases the security. Like, like if we have some kind of history for every user, we'll be able to look at like, oh, this user has been very good with our data and like he's used it in a better way. So it will be like, you will have a better kind of, uh, security and uh, like uh, more less restrictions and kind of things right so yeah yes okay. like and that trust and that trust is because of, of this, this is a marketplace there is a natural incentive layer to have high quality data and to not be a bad actor because if you or if you get caught kind of contributing bad data it's gonna affect your mm -hmm. reputation and gonna directly affect your ability to monetize that in the future and so by having this open market we have we incentivize everyone to be truthful to their with their data inputs Oh, that makes sense. And uh, yeah, so we have a next question from Mohan Mukherjee, who asked like, who or what determines the value of an NFT? So NFTs are, are pretty broad and can represent a lot of different assets between collectibles or kind of representing real world assets. So NFTs can have a few different ways of valuing it. For a data NFT specifically, um, one way that I've heard from before from our friends at Data Whale is describing it is it can be that the price of that NFT should be based on how much income you're going to be generating off of the base ERC-20 tokens. And so because these NFTs represent claims to fungible assets, you can you can then kind of back into the price of like how much you should pay for an NFT based on how valuable you can make money off the data off of the ERC-20s. That's one way of looking at it, but in kind of one way that kind of fits well for data NFTs. So if I kind of like change some word, is it similar to stock? Like if there is more need of one NFT, it will, uh, it's the price of that will like rise up. And uh, is it similar to that, the value? Uh, as, 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 yes, like as more kind of access and control is taken, as more access is like kind of bought to the data NFT and like kind of tokens go up, and they start generating more money and it's, it starts flowing back to the IP holder. Yes, you would start mm -hmm. to see the base, the value of the base IP start to go up because more people are buying it, and so more income is being generated. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah. 
And uh, yeah. the next question is. Oh, sorry. In the ocean marketplace, so currently as a data provider, you set your own price initially. There's a couple mm -hmm. of pricing methods that you can choose from. You can allow someone to download, pay one time and download your data. Um, you can allow mm -hmm. them for a, a, a time-based access to your information. Um, and you can, you can sell it for a fixed price or you can mm -hmm. um, create a liquidity pool. Um, and in the new V4 Ocean Marketplace that's just been launched, um, they introduced one-sided staking. So that means a data provider has to provide some upfront um, liquidity when they create and launch a data NFT to pr provide security for the marketplace against rug pulls and things of that nature. Um, and, and when you do that, you get to set the price of your token and decide how many of your data access token um, are an equivalent to one Ocean token, for example. Um, but from that point on, the the price is determined by uh, supply and demand and an automated market maker built off of balancer technology. So individuals can publish data on the ocean marketplace, but you can also come to the ocean marketplace and invest in data assets that you think are going to perform well or experience uh, a lot of uh, uh, a lot of uh, a transaction history. You can say you can stake on those assets and for a, a portion of the transaction fees. Uh, all right. And uh, this was a question set for now. And I would like to uh, say that if you have uh, any more in this session, we can continue. Or would you like to take uh, different questions right now, which we have? Um, it, makes, it makes sense. We can kind of maybe finish up and Timothy can kind of go into Athena. And then we can have kind of one last question session at the end, kind of address all of them. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, it's perfectly fine. Yeah, we can go ahead with Athena. Cool. Awesome. Yep. So now my partner, Tim Timothy, is going to kind of go over Athena and what we're focused mm -hmm. on working on. Okay. Thanks. So Athena Protocol is building a suite of tools for a data-driven environmental and social governance future. Um, we work to bridge the gap between real world and the blockchain and bring stakeholders together with the decision-making processes that affect their lives. Um, we're committed to algorithmic accountability and combating discriminatory bias and automated systems, as well as leveraging distributed ledger technologies for a sustainable and equi equitable future. Um, standards are infrastructure. You're way ahead. Way ahead. Seventeen. Yeah. So we're, standards are um, infrastructure upon which all economic uh, systems are built. Uh, so in a world that runs on data. Uh, where automated decision-making processes determine real-world outcomes and AI algorithms, uh, AI algorithms are growing uh, to govern a, an ever-increasing number of human activities. Uh, decentralized data governance is a matter of equity and accessibility at the most foundational level. And so, let me see, that's the right slide you can see there. Um, da the previous slide has just a few examples of uh, critical systems that are left to rely on centralized infrastructure for their consumption and distribution of data. So while the real world runs on data, that doesn't mean that it runs on good information. From healthcare to real estate to facial recognition software, the past decade has offered many examples of ways in which discriminatory bias can find its way into our algorithmic decision-making process. Several years ago here in the United States, for example, health insurance providers were shocked when they realized that the inequality being perpetuated by forecasting models used to determine annual healthcare budgets for patients. These models were used to make projections, which were in turn used to set budgets for an insurance policy holder's annual healthcare spending. Year over year, for well over a decade, these models had been predicting less and less money was needed for African Americans due to learned bias in predictive models. At the time, researchers found that if the models were left unadjusted, then in as short as five years, African Americans could be receiving as little as five to 10 cents on the dollar for healthcare compared to other demographics. So it's clear from this how bad data can and has been affecting our lives. And I could go on about these examples for hours. Believe me, that's why I started this project. Uh, and in my time as an environmental and public health policy campaigns director, I've become intimately familiar with the many ways decision making processes driven by bad data negatively impact our lives and our communities. So in order to address this problem uh, of bad data and environmental and social governance, we're proposing a radical shift in the way that we account for social and ecological well-being. Um, this is 
where our work to decentralize the setting of data collection standards meets the privacy preserving technologies of Ocean Protocol. Through a combination of IoT and field monitoring, edge computation and privacy preserving zero knowledge proof procedures, we are working to remove the excuses big polluters use to hide from transparency while helping companies who want to be sustainable turn reporting costs into secondary sources of revenue. Rather than a system of environmental accounting that relies on generalizations and heuristics, opaque reporting standards, and looks at everything at, or at all costs as externalizable, we propose an ecological approach that uses real, uh, uses near time, near real time monitoring and in situ collab, uh, calibrations to bring transparency and verifiability to environmental and social governance. So in the next slide, we have some example of legacy financial assets and systems um, that uh, uh, you, you see in your typical environment, or environmental and social governance uh, marketplace. And those assets are backed and reliant on, they're, they're reliant on trust um, and they uh, suffer from a lack of transparency and a lack of enforceability. Um, we are working with a, a, a large network of uh, Web3 blockchain related uh, industry peers to help create the next generation of regenerative financial assets from data NFTs to regenerative NFTs to tokenized carbon offsets that remove deduplication and fraud in environmental and social governance markets. So, as I said before, standards of the infrastructure upon which all economic systems are built. And here at Athena, we work to decentralize the system of setting and maintaining standards in environmental and social governance to combat corporate greenwashing and gatekeeping and sustainability. Our solutions uh, uh, turn or make, make use of programmable data to prove verifiable claims and allow for, and for a decentralized system of accreditation to drive sustainable goals in, well into the future. But we can't do this alone uh, and we don't intend to. We've mentioned a few times uh, Ocean Protocol and, Athe and Athena uh, uh, in the context of both a decentralized autonomous organization or a DAO. A DAO is at its core an organizational structure and governance process that allows for the collective management of common goods, which can be economic or non-economic. And in a DAO, the rules of operation and organizational logic are often encoded as smart contracts on distributed ledgers whose rules of operation can and probably should include mechanisms to change the rules themselves. The goal of which being to centrally govern control over decision making and governance. DAOs create the opportunity to realign, streamline, and automate organizational structure and operations in ways that are more equitable, transparent, and involve many more stakeholders than centralized leg legacy structures. Um, but I'm not here to talk about why DAOs are the organizational structure of the future, even though they are. Uh, but I mentioned them because when it comes to setting the standards for environmental and social governance, we see that DAOs offers solutions to many of the issues that currently plague sustainable policy. The benefits start with transparency and extend well beyond from the ability to involve not just all, or not just a few, but all stakeholders in the decision-making processes of, nat, uh, of natural resource management um, to finding and connecting global resources to local initiatives. The climate crisis is a global one, but the solutions are local and the, the issues are local. And so in order for us to intelligently uh, uh, and effectively address the, the climate crisis, we need to be able to connect uh, international and global resources with boots on the ground uh, and, and give those individuals the, uh, the, the right to govern the processes that affect their communities. Um, yep, that's about it. And we can take more questions if you have, if you like, but here are a few ways you guys can get involved. If you haven't already, I would, uh, and you are found today's talk interesting, I would strongly recommend completing the Ocean Academy at oceanacademy.io. You can learn more about their base technology um, as well as data sovereignty and compute to data. You can claim our um, Dead Space 2022 POAP um, to stay apprised of, of future updates and projects through a lit protocol. Um, submit your proof of completion at Ocean Academy uh, to become eligible to be as a member of a, the Athena protocol and then get busy forking and biddling um, during DevSpace 2022. You saw the ocean market um, 
displayed earlier, we welcome all contest or any participants to fork the ocean marketplace, reflavor the, the front end, um, and uh, to, we look forward to seeing what you guys have uh, at the end of the event. Yeah, thank you for that amazing keynote, Timothy. And uh, now we'll be taking up more questions from the chat. So the first one is like uh, asked by Kaushal Lati. He asked that what role could Web3 play uh, in revolutionizing education? Yeah, so something that jump, comes to mind immediately from 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 me is that you know during the 2016 election cycle, a number of uh, my colleagues had to spend um, about six to eight months rapidly digitizing environmental um, science records, records of uh, uh, sustainable science research, um, research into climate science, um, because of political um, issues happening here domestically in the United States at the time. Um, and so when you have decentralized file storage and decentralized data marketplaces, um, uh, you, uh, you remove the ability for a big brother type to censor entirely all some one class of information, whether that's keeping a population from understanding the environmental factors that are affecting um, their lives, or if that's keeping um, women from understanding uh, basic contraceptive uh, methodologies, those types of things. And we see uh, we see that monster take a different uh, appearance in different parts of the world. Um, different uh, authority structures like to control different uh, flows of information. Um, but as far as education, we think that that should be in the hands of an individual, that they should have the access to whatever information they, they choose um, to consume. And then they should be able to intelligently assess the, the veracity of that information, the truthfulness of that information, you know, the reality of the, uh, of the situation. And so it kind of removes the monopoly, like everyone can have the access to every kind of information and like they can trust it better. And yeah. So right, we're, all con yeah. we're all contributing to a shared knowledge base and we're all getting better together as opposed to having, trying to like hoard the data and get, be the smartest yourself. It's a, we're mm -hmm. gonna make a bigger pie of information and knowledge. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, that sounds good. Really, yeah. And the ne next question is from Nila Sharan. He is asking about the Ocean Ambassador Program. So, can you explain more about it? Yeah. So, the Ocean Ambassador Program is really encouraging to get people to understand and make use of Ocean Protocol, understanding the data economy, and getting involved to spread the word. And so, you can you, can, you join the program by going to Ocean Academy and getting your certificate and submitting it. And then join, jumping into the Ocean Protocol Discord and getting involved. And so they have, the ambassadors program has different type of internal bounties they use depending on kind of driving traffic, creating uh, blog posts, you know, posting about on social media. And so really anybody can get involved in the ambassador program and help to spread the mm -hmm. word of this. Because of this data economy, really one of the biggest barriers is kind of an under, a philosophical change by many in the world from we don't own our data to no, we are in control of our data. That requires a lot of ambassadors spreading the word to a lot of different localities. And so I really encourage everyone, if you have any interest in helping to accelerate this economy, this data economy, get involved in the Ocean Ambassadors Program and jump into Discord and come talk to us. Yeah, so as you said that anyone can get involved, is there like any kind of prerequisite or uh, like it's completely, if you can write blogs, if you can be anything good in tech, you can join it, right? So. Right. Yeah. Anybody involved, there's no kind of gatekeeping. Like, it's, uh, mm -hmm. I believe you need to go through the Ocean Bat. The, you need to go through Ocean Academy, and which mm -hmm. is kind of which gives a very high level overview and kind of a, a great educational crash course into everything Ocean Protocol, so that you kind of have a high, a, good, a strong level of understanding of the program and like how how uh, Ocean Protocol really works. Well, so that reminds me of a question. Uh, if like we need to get to know more about NFTs, blockchain, Web three to get involved in Ocean Ambassador program. Uh, like, do you cons uh, do you recommend anything to us to like learn more about it? Yes, definitely the Ocean Academy. Um, uh, the 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 Ocean One Hundred One course, the first course on Ocean Academy, it actually um, concludes with an invitation to the Ocean Ambassadors Program, um, and invites you to uh, to register, and then invites you to the community Discord, uh, where you'll be greeted. Um, I think we greet. Um, new ambassadors bi-weekly each month twice a month and 
Um, yeah, you, there's no specific skill set required. You know, the, I think the Web3 community generally, um, we embrace autonomy. And so we want individuals to come um, to, to because they're passionate about the work and to, to do what they're passionate um, um, at work. Yeah. And uh, the next question is from Nilesharan as well. He asked, like, what is the advantage of regenerative NFTs over bonds? So regenerative NFTs really allow kind of everyone to take part in this ecosystem, whereas bonds are really kind of uh, have a financial product are really kind of layered into only a certain entities can kind of get that. They have their own existing origination fees, and very specific structures of who can access it as well as a certain level of kind of lack of transparency because of the structures of bond reporting and who can do it. Regenerative NFTs allow anyone to get involved. They can kind of purchase into NFTs and send their money, as well as by being kind of blockchain native, we can allow that data traceability and data provenance to back up those assets with our data NFTs. And so as opposed to bonds, in which case there need to be several intermediaries to help get the full transparency and reporting as well, and which you can never really get. Um, but for generative NFTs, you can see who contributed, where the money went to, and then how backing up how how the NFT is actually helping the world with kind of data-driven insights. Yeah, that makes sense. And uh, I was like looking, so you guys work with blockchain, uh, ML, data science, all kind of stuff. So uh, like how is AI involved in Web3? Like uh, how can it make it better? Like what are the advantages it gives to Web3? So... Yeah, one of the biggest ways that AI is used in Web3 is simulation modeling. Um, whether it's Token Spice and, or CAD CAD, anybody interested in token engineering should pick up one of those two tools. Um, they're relatively simple to use, um, and CAD CAD is, especially uses AI agents um, to uh, uh, to model behavior in a complex system, a value-driven system. Um, I think one of the uh, interests that we have specifically most at Athena protocol is a, a anomaly detection in, in environmental monitoring, uh, being able to, you know, we want to be able to build near real time monitoring systems where those observations can then be used to back um, digitized assets. And we don't want that, um, that data collection methodology to be uh, gameable in any way. We want it to be automated and, and cost reduced, but not, um, not gameable and not cheatable. We want to be careful about what we incentivize. So they're real, like real, real time or close to real time anomaly detection models are, are something that we work a lot on day to day. But I think that generally, as far as the Web3 goes, that, um, you know, GANs, uh, general adversarial networks, you know, most of the NFT mints that I see coming out on a day to day basis are produced by GANs. Um, and it's really awesome to see the long term uh, the long term applications of that in the commercial industry. Like when you can sit down and just create a hundred dresses in 10 minutes instead of, um, you know, employing a designer to spend six months to come up with one dress. Yeah, exactly. And a very big aspect on the flip side, not just how AI will affect blockchain, but how blockchain will affect AI by having kind of like that data provenance and traceability into what's going into our model, who's accessing the model and getting that full accountability. We can get really improved AI and really help to avoid the problem of garbage in garbage out, where no matter how good you are at modeling, if you have bad data going in, you're going to have a bad model. Blockchain really helps to give us that traceability and trust into the data going into our models. And by having that open sharing of data, thanks to Ocean Protocol, we're going to start to see kind of AI hit absolute new levels of, of trust and efficiency and use because of this. And blockchain is going to help really accelerate that. So if I kind of get it correctly, it's like AI kind of speeds up the process for blockchain and blockchain kind of uh, make AI more secure, right? So it kind of helps both of them and it uh, it's like much better. Right? Like, so yeah, and that wraps up the Q&A session. Thank you, Christian and Timothy for sharing your knowledge and experience with us. Thanks to everyone who tuned in for this keynote. We hope your hackathon projects are going well and that you are enjoying your time at DevSpace. Make sure to check out our Instagram handle at CSIVITU and follow us on LinkedIn to stay up to date with all our events. Have a great day and happy hacking. Have a good day, everyone. Thanks for having us. Yeah, it was awesome to have you. GG boys, GG Priyanshu, Kiamata. Oh, I did it right.
Hai. Oke,